you know, you've been here for about a half hour, and I'm looking at you. And like I said, I've known you for a long time, yeah. you know? And I could see the change in you, like how you slowed down. <laughs> I could see physically that you're a dad now. Yeah, not only you know, am I a dad, bro, but I mean... It's weird when you see somebody, they go, I got eight kids. Right. But they look younger than you. Right, you know what right, I'm saying? Right, right. Now I could tell you have the dad stuff. And uh, it's just, uh, it, it was good to see you. It was good to hear from you. The whole thing, you know, uh, I, I had run as easy on the show one day. Here. Oh, nice, man. And um, when the show wrapped at the end, we were talking. He said that you had tried to call him or called him or reached yeah, out. Yeah. And I was like, you know, bro, that's the... I go, that's the best thing, you know, whatever. He reached out. He said, hello, whatever. And then a month later, he reached out to me. And it took me like a week to wrap my head around <laughs> the whole situation. Because when you called, you called offering something that a lot of people never offer in their life. They never do. And I wouldn't do it either until I got locked up, Carlos. Right. It took me getting locked up to right. finally go to people and go, hey, bro, can I talk to you for a second? <laughs> That time I choked you. Right. <laughs> I feel you, dude. I feel I, you. I fucked up, though. I feel you, dude. I fucked up, and if there's anything I can do in the future to help you out. Right. You know, whatever. There's a dude I poked in the eye one time. <laughs> because he kept arguing with me, bro. At a fucking car dealership. <laughs> He pissed me off so, and I was in, I was on probation, dude. I'm laughing because I know how you feel. I was bro. on federal probation. Right. And this guy kept fucking with me about a right. restaurant. I kept going, bro. Right. I'm not going over. I'm going here. And he got in my face, and he was taller than me. <laughs> he was tall, and I was on probation, and he crowded my space, and I fucking stuck my finger in his fucking eyeball. <laughs> and guess what? He showed him at my comedy show, the Denver Comedy Works. Oh no way! And he, before he could say to me like, "I'm sorry about that dago dog." First off, I had no right touching you. Right. Like, no matter what the fuck you said to me. Right. And then after the show, we talked again, and he goes, I couldn't even fathom my head about what you said. Like, the day you contacted me, Carlos, it blew me away. Oh, no, and man. It blew me away because even what's going on in the news, everybody blames everybody else. Right. You know? And it drives me fucking crazy. And there's times... That I see somebody doing it, and I go, you know what? And it wasn't until I took responsibilities, you know? Right. And it was nice when you said, you I'm going to have a child, and I'm going to start coming around, and I just don't want no ill feelings. And Carlos, I never had ill feelings for you. I swear to God. Oh, that wasn't it. Not at all. It Not was about all. me, though, dude. No, I know. I know you know where you're what I mean? from Because me. I, listen, man, uh, I'm a different, we all grow. We all evolve. I was a young kid who discovered comedy when I started doing stand-up. I, I didn't have any idols. I didn't I didn't know what stand-up was. I just remember I would go to work uh, at Farmer's Insurance, and I would tell these guys about stuff that I saw on the news that pissed me off that I thought was absurd. I wasn't trying to be funny. They were the ones that said, you should do stand-up. I didn't know what stand-up was. I started doing stand-up at that time. And I come from the projects, you know, it's funny when I hear people say, hey, man, you ever go back to the projects? And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, you know, back to your roots, back to you, where you grew up, back to those. And I say, look, I don't know about anybody else, but those people never supported me. When I told them I was going to do comedy, all I heard was like, hey, you're fucking funny or whatever. There was never a like, you know, until I started coming out on TV. Then they were like, hey, bro, you're from here and all that shit. But before that, there was no support. It was like, you're stupid, you're dumb, you're not gonna make it, what's wrong with you, why are you standing? And I remember the first time I went to the comedy store, I I walked off stage and somebody tapped another comedian and he goes, he was a Latino comic, quote unquote, at the comedy store at that time. And he goes, dude, there's your replacement. And I was like, whoa, what the fuck, what is this? And I remember just going, you know what, I, I can't deal with all this stuff. I can't let this in my head. I need to, I, I, I can't give up being an engineer to do comedy and not make it work because this is my family depending on me. I mean, I was the first one to, to really come out and be able to get a good job as an engineer. Do you have any idea? Dude, my family had an intervention for me when I started doing stand up. I mean, they literally sat around and told me that I was 
stupid and ruining my life. And so when I started going to the comedy store and there was all this back and forth and all these comics bickering, I said, you know what? I'm not going to get into this. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't hang out. I went in there. I did what I did. I left. But I needed I needed to feel like I remember walking off stage and going, man, I killed. And the you know, the older comics who knew how to kill, they'd look at me like, what is, what is what is up with this kid? But for me, that was the best I'd ever done. And I had to look at it that way. I couldn't sit around and go, well, yeah, I, I got to grow. I, I, I had to be that guy to deal with everything that came at me at the time. And what ends up happening is, you know, after a while for me, after Mina Mencia, after all of it, going out on the road, I had to look back and go, all right, man. There are a lot of comics out there that don't like you. A lot of comics you don't even know don't like you. What is that all about? And I had to go, it's got to be something that I did, that I said, that I, it's got to be me. It can't be all of these guys. And um, that's when I kind of started going, okay, how did I behave toward these people? How did I behave toward those people? And I had to say to myself, look, dude, you you were a dick. You were, you were, you were cocky as fuck, arrogant to others. And you went into the comedy store, granted. I grew up where other comics, when they made it, they would come and bump us and run the light. Paul Mooney always ran the light. And, you know, I, wa- I, f- I felt like I earned it at that time and I wanted to do the same. But I came at a time of transition and I didn't pay attention to those around me. I didn't give a shit. You know, somebody would say, oh, you're going to bump me? I-, I got shit to do or whatever. I mean, I think most of the time I would say, okay. But other than that, I... I think a lot of those guys felt intimidated, and when they got a chance to shit on me, they did. And I, listen, bro, don't get me wrong. There were times where I had a gun in my hand and I was going to go to the comedy store and shoot some people. I mean, it was it were dark, bro. There were dark moments, like really dark, suicidal, homicidal thoughts. Um, it, it wasn't always pretty, bro. But I got to a place where I could say, you know what, I need to look at how I've treated people and talk to these guys and set it right because I don't want to step foot at the improv, the comedy store, whatever comedy club is and feel that look that I felt for 10 or so years of like, oh, fuck, there's that guy. Um, And I just don't want that anymore. I don't know how everybody's going to react that I talk to. But I'm calling everybody that I feel I did something to or might have done something to to just say, hey, man, I'm sorry that I treated you that way. You deserve more respect, regardless of regardless of me having a TV show. And at the time, Steve Ren is easy not having a TV show. I didn't have to bump him and, you know, go on 30 minutes longer than I should have. I did, but I didn't have to. And now I look back at that and I go, OK, that's what you had to do. That's how you felt at the time. Good. Move on. Stay in your place. So that's where I'm at now. It's so weird how I saw the whole thing unfold. (laughs) And it's so weird how when you called, I mentioned Amy Schumer to you. And I said, you know, I'm sitting here. Amy Schumer released a special. Amy Schumer released something a year ago, and then she released something on TV. They attacked her. And then she released this last special. And I didn't, guys, I'm in my own world sometimes. I got the baby. Sure. I shot this thing for Animal Planet. You're on the road, you you know. Yeah. And all of a sudden, one day I go to the comedy store about a month ago, and Mm -hmm. I go into the back. They have a back area outside. I haven't haven't been. They have a bar, and then they have a back area outside. I had to wait. I don't want to sit in there because I got anxiety when I sit in the kitchen. Okay. You know, I look at the waitress. I said, they're 20 years old. I'm fucking 50. (laughs) What am I doing here? (laughs) What am I doing with my life? Sure. So I go outside. I'm sitting out there, Carlos, and all of a sudden, these younger comics, which they knew me. I didn't know them. I can't lie to you. Right. They're talking about Amy Schumer and how she got a one rating and how they're accusing her of this and they're accusing her of that. And I sat there and I didn't say two words because I don't right. know what the fuck I'm talking about. So right. I, I speak when you don't know what the fuck. But I listened. Right. And I knew that 
all their accusations were upon words. Like, what well, this guy said this, and this guy said right. that. And I didn't say a word. I got on stage. I got in my car. But on the way home, I said to, me, I said to myself, one thing about life is that once you succeed in this game, they come out from all over. Right. They come from all over. I got, listen, I went to the store. You, yeah. you, uh, <laughs> this guy, Doug Stanhope, called, and they told me you got to wait six months. I got here January 29th. I got a call February fucking 10th telling me you got a showcase for Mitzi Shrug. Well, I thought it was six months from now. We we had a fallout. I went there. I did three minutes. She told me, can you do 10? Come back next week. Come back I, I next like, week I like, I, like, I, like, I like Cuban people. Oh, that was she said? Yeah, that's what she told me. <laughs> then the next week, she passed me. February 19th on my birthday, and when I walked out, she goes, you're a regular now. I have an idea. We'll dress you up like Fidel. Oh, Jesus. And you go up on stage oh, with a cigar. Jesus. And I'm like, okay, Mitzi, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so now I moved down here with a bunch of dudes from Seattle. Right. I'm down here with Brody Stevens and Josh Wolf oh, and fucking Brody, bro, all yeah. these dudes. And they all come to the comedy store to see my debut at 1130. And I'm ready to go up. I got my water bottle. Right. I decided to go up there and right. bomb for 16 people. Sure. And I get a tap on the shoulder. It's my main man, Eddie Griffin. Yeah. He goes, play it. Let me hear I want to try this new bit and shit. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'll be up there for 15 minutes and uh-huh. shit. Dog, it was fucking an hour, for, an hour later. in the morning. Sure. Dog. You know, did I come back the next day and kick him in the stomach? <laughs> Guess what? I understood the rules. But the rules, the rules changed, though. The rules changed. Well, the rules were bent and bent and bent and bent and bent until they just broke. Right. Until they just fucking broke. Exactly. The rules kept. Listen, I don't, I, I don't, I don't mind somebody coming in. When I got there, when I first got to the store, you weren't really there, but Gary Shandling was still right. coming in. Right. Andrew was still coming right. in. And you know what? Andrew bumped. Sure. Animalistically. Everybody. Everybody Listen, bumped. Here's the weird thing, and and again, like this sounds like an excuse to a lot of the young comics it, it, this is the way it used to be i never ever ever got on stage at the comedy store that i can ever remember on time anytime after 9 30 and mitzi would always put me on late because she didn't want me on early so she would give me a 10 30 spot dude it was always 12 it was always 12 it was always somebody coming in. It was always, oh, Martin Lawrence is here? Oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah, Martin Lawrence. Oh, shit. You know what I mean? It was, it was, it was, it was just, it was always somebody. There was always somebody.